Thank you everyone who's still here. I know it's been a very long packed day and it's a Friday, so deep appreciation that you've all made the time, taken the time to be here. And I'm really excited to, um, to talk to this panel and I'm really especially happy that someone has decided at the very last minute to join us up here on stage. So um, today we have Carolyn Morin, we have Judy Pearl, and we have Jessica Del Juravesh. And the, before I introduce them, the idea behind this panel is that as we've talked to record labels, to individual artists, to music organizations, venues, what we have found and what we know is that the music industry has been the hardest hit um, coming out of COVID. And so in some ways, it's been hard for people to wrap their head around prioritizing what to do to address the climate emergency when tours are being canceled and so many musicians are struggling to make ends meet. And so we wanted to kind of end on a positive note that there are opportunities. And so we're gonna delve into that a little bit and talk about some of the funding that's available from our federal government, money that was committed in March. But first I'll let, um, I'll let all these wonderful panelists um, talk to you about their organizations and what they're doing. So um, to my immediate left is Carolyn Warren, who's the Director General of Arts Granting Programs at the Canada Council for the Arts. And in this role, she oversees the Council's granting programs and strategic initiatives, which seek to foster the creation, distribution, and promotion of Canadian art at home and internationally. And Carolyn's had a really varied career from working um, as the Vice President of Arts at the Banff Centre for the Arts and Creativity. Um, she's worked as a Manager of Cultural Programming and been an Executive Producer at the CBC based in Montreal. Um, she has a wealth of experience to, to bring to this conversation. Um, we also have Judy Pearl at the end, um, who's Associate Producer for English Theatre at Canada's National Arts Centre and Co-Founder and Operations Lead at SCALE, um, who is one of the sponsoring organizations for today. SCALE is the Sectoral Climate Arts Leadership for the Emergency, and Music Declares Emergency has been involved with SCALE as well. Um, she's been a passionate environmentalist since her teen years, and she's honoured to be working with colleagues across the country to mobilize Canada's arts and culture sector for the climate emergency. And then we also have Jessica, who um, is with the Ontario Arts Council, and very graciously agreed to come up here um, at, the, at the last minute. So we're gonna keep it kind of casual, kind of a conversation about what are the opportunities, what are some of the funders doing, what, what more could be done, and who else do we need to tap and bring into this conversation. I think the, are we gonna use this mic and just pass it down, is that okay? All right, is there anyone who would like to, to start? Yeah, okay, right. So hi, everyone. Um, I have to say that last panel is kind of a hard one to follow. Uh, as when you talk about funding, you know, the, the eyes tend to glaze over. But I will say um, it's really fantastic to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I was really excited that this event was happening. Um, the Canada Council is really interested in supporting this kind of convening and discussion and dialogue, as well as the other things we support around climate change. Um, but I know this was a first for the industry, and so congratulations. Uh, and I also think it's pretty fantastic that it's ending with a concert, because I think, as many people have said today, if there's one thing music and the arts can do that absolutely nobody else can, it is touch the hearts and minds of people and bring us together um, around a number of different issues, and certainly around this one. I thought Sarah Harmer had a, a, a great expression there about transforming human lives through, through art. Um, so first off, uh, we are already funding a number of um, creative projects and also what I guess I would call a capacity building projects, and one of them is actually sitting over there to my left uh, in the form of scale, and we'll talk about that I'm sure a little bit later. Um, but just to say, while, while we're also planning, I mean, there's a bunch of organizations, CBC, Telefilm, a, a lot of organizations are coming out with green visions and green plans. Uh, we've got one uh, in, in the works as well. It'll be published in the spring, but we have started already with a number of different funding um, supports. So 
perhaps I'll start with the, like the creative stuff, um, which is the heart and soul of, of what we do in the arts. Uh, and many of you will be familiar with our regular programs. There are six of them. They cover every aspect of research, production, presenting, touring. Uh, and through those programs, we're already seeing a number of um, artistic projects that are getting funding that are dealing with land and climate um, from a variety of different perspectives. You're probably seeing this at the OAC as well, yeah. And, uh, and we're delighted to be able to um, support and advance those kinds of projects, and there's room for more. Um, it's always a tricky thing when you're a funder to, to be talking about, nobody wants to say, you guys should be doing this kind of project. So we don't want to be in a position where being prescriptive or saying, you know, there's a, that, that, you know, there's an advantage to doing a, a, a climactically themed project over another one. It's, it's hard, it, that, that instrumentalizing of the arts is a really dangerous thing for funders, and we don't want to go anywhere near it. Um, and we're also not trying to say, you know, we need to moralize to and, and lecture audiences around what they should or shouldn't be doing. But what I've heard here all day from the artists who've spoken is just a very clear desire to connect through their microphones and their, their natural reach and influence to connect with, with audiences and to be responsible uh, and to play a role in, in raising awareness for, for climate change. So it's actually been a really interesting, it's really been great for me to hear um, the degree to which this group is super engaged and feeling that uh, that you do have a role in terms of, um, and a responsibility because of this thing that you, you hold in your hands and the number of people you can reach through music um, and of all ages. So creatively, regular programs, absolutely. We also have something called um, the Strategic Innovation Fund, which is a, we call it a strategic fund, which just means it's not a regular program. It's uh, more flexible. Uh, it's $225 million over five years, which is a pretty sizable amount of money. And um, it's designed for artists, for groups, and for organizations. So really for anyone uh, who wants to tackle a big systemic problem. Climate change is the one we're talking about today and probably the greatest challenge we're facing. Uh, but there are others in this sector, in the music industry, in other parts of the art sector, uh, digital capacity building, diversity, equity, and inclusion, indigenous reconciliation. These are all big systemic issues. They're not ours alone in the art sector. They belong to all of us, and they require collective action. So that fund is really there to help at every stage. So when you start wondering about what could that mean for me, or how could I begin to think about principles of equity and diversion in my work, for example, or how can I begin to think about climate change in my work, you can ask for a small grant. We have seed, cultivate, and grow grants, and guess what? They're small, mid-sized, and big, and the small ones really are for research, thinking about what the problem you want to solve might look, you know, who you might want to do it with, what it might look like. The, the, the next phase of the, the, cult, the Cultivate grants are really meant to give you an opportunity to work with a partner and experiment, a partner or two, and start to experiment, put things into practice, maybe a pilot. Um, the big grants, and they're really big, they're up to a million dollars, so they require that you have had a project that's been developed to a certain point where it's been you know, piloted and, or a prototype of some kind that we think if we give you an extra whack of cash, you can really scale it up for impact across the entire sector. So those are the grants, and you can enter them, at, you don't have to go in order. If you're ready to, to, to move to a pilot on an idea, you have a project, it's a tour, you want to try out something new, you can apply for that middle-ranged uh, grant. Um, there's there's no, no specific you know, requirement to have one before you can apply for another. Um, and, and then there was also, a, as part of that fund, we're also developing a whole bunch of new networks and partnerships and contributions that don't fit into the normal categories of grant and competition so that we can, uh, so that we can start developing the networks and resources that are required 
to, just to help kickstart this thing. And I mean, I'm sitting next to one of the projects that we funded, which is for me an example of one of the ways we need to work to move forward, which is scale, and we'll hear more about it from you in a minute, so I won't say much more then. If we don't think about networking the way you have, um, and connecting people working in this space across the country, and I would also add beyond the art sector, not only in the art sector, we tend to think by discipline and by sector. And I think that's a mistake when you're looking at a big systemic issue like climate change, which doesn't belong to music, it doesn't belong to performing arts broadly, and it doesn't belong to the arts. And there are people doing really good work in other sectors who we could be learning from, collaborating with, and we can support that. We can actually fund it. So the money isn't going out of the arts sector, but it will go to those in the arts sector who are working with partners who are bringing in those new perspectives and new solutions. The other one we've supported, and then I'll stop and, and pass the mic, um, is the, um, the Creative Green Tools, which has been spoken about all day long. Uh, and we were there really early on to, to support that initiative, because again, profoundly important that we have data, baselines, a way, a standard way of measuring what is our footprint, whether it's for a building or an office or a festival or a tour. Um, and this comes from Julie's Bicycle in the UK. It's been immensely successful. I'm thrilled that it's here in Canada. Uh, and uh, I was actually very thrilled to hear, I have to say, the gentleman who suggested that we need um, blunt and bold, I think it was you, uh, requirements, uh, and yeah, we'll be looking at those. Um, and just to put a, a plug in for, for Quebec, because uh, I don't see anyone up here from Quebec, but the, the arts funder, ah, bonjour, bienvenue. Um, it's really impressive what the Conseil des Arts et de l'Art du Québec is doing with, um, with creative tools. They've already got 80 organizations voluntarily uh, engaging with those tools. Um, so what we'd like to see is the rest of Canada uh, having a similar uptake because of course the more of us who are using the tool, the more effective it will be in the long term. I gave you a great plug. And now over to my colleague from the Ontario Arts Council and it's entirely my fault I made her come up here. So <laughs> I am really sorry for that. Not a problem, I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll give a very brief who I am. I'm Jessica Daljervesh. I'm one of two music officers at the Ontario Arts Council, and I've been there since about 2007. And I'm originally from Ottawa with a background in music. Uh, studied classical music, played viola, did some jazz singing, that sort of thing. So I know the artist side of things. And then um, I've also worked uh, in various roles at the Ontario Arts Council, including uh, supporting our touring programs and, and market development. Um, as well as an associate director of granting role for a couple of years. Um, but I'm now back in my music home. And um, I will say I came here to learn. I came here to hear what you had to say. So uh, if you haven't already grabbed my card and have more you want to say to me later, I'd be happy to hear it. And I'm here also at the wish of our uh, very new as uh, CEO uh, Michael Murray, who himself is has a background as a musician in in the music field, and is very passionate and wants OAC to play a role there. So when we say we want to hear what those things are you want funders to do and what our role is, that's where that's coming from. A very uh, very honest, true place of wanting to hear um, from you. I haven't prepared, but there's a couple of things that I will say that I think are really important um, for artists and arts organizations to know and be reminded of. You can apply to our existing programs to do the things you're doing in an environmentally sustainable way. There's, this activity is eligible. Travel is eligible. How you decide to travel and the case you make for how you travel you can make that already. And the people reading those applications are artists themselves who will understand why you're making those choices because those are choices that they're considering themselves. So always think about who that person is on the other end. It's not, a, it, it's not me making those decisions, it's your fellow artists who likely care about the same things you do and are thinking about the same things you do. So it's not always about a special program to do something. Um, it's about um, 
using those existing programs to move that forward, whether that's in terms of thematically what you want to put together artistically with the new work about the water or what have you, or if it's about how you conduct that event. Um, so for we heard earlier from Marie Zimmerman from um, Hillside, they receive operating uh, support from the Ontario Arts Council for years. And that, again, it's they are making those choices and that's recognized. I know even if it doesn't say the criteria there um, about environmental consciousness, that, that's part of, it, it filters in in other ways through impact on the community you're working within and assessors get that and understand that because they're thinking of those things themselves. Um, the other thing I want to say is there, we are thinking about very much how our programs um, <laughs> support, um, but also are sometimes a barrier to um, people making the changes that they want to make in, in an environmentally conscious way. And we have taken the opportunity of a pause on our regular touring programs to talk about do we fund touring anymore? Is that an environmentally conscious thing to be doing? Um, how do we do that? How do we encourage and, and make sure that our programs are receptive and open to different ways of touring that might be more environmentally friendly, such as, um, uh, such as staying in one region for a longer period of time for that deeper engagement rather than traveling across Europe or what have you. So that's slow touring. Um, so those are the conversations we've been having in order to um, reinvigorate our, our, our touring support in a way that takes this under into consideration. So there'll be more coming out on that very soon. Um, and also how our assessment feeds into that. Uh, do we do we prioritize things in a certain way, but yet also being, and I, I think I made reference to this earlier, also being conscious of where we are putting pressures on the artists in different ways um, to do things in a certain way. So th there's always that delicate balance as a funder to, uh, as my colleague rightly said, to not be too directive, but to allow for, for these things and to, where possible, encourage them. Hi, so um, I'm Judy from SCALE, and uh, my actual day job is at the National Arts Centre. Um, and um, so, so and I know some of you already know about SCALE, there's some of you are already our members, but for those in the room who don't know about SCALE yet, I'll just explain very quickly. Um, SCALE is an acronym, it stands for Sectoral Climate Arts Leadership for the Emergency, and, I, and for me, like, kind of the, almost the most important word in there is leadership. Um, because we believe that uh, the cultural sector, we are the culture makers. Um, there's a huge gap, as we've been talking about all day, between us like knowing what needs to be done in terms of the transition to a climate safe future, but actually changing who we are. In a way, it's like it's not enough to, to know, we have to actually change who we are. And that comes down to culture, and that's us. And so SCALE was started um, about a year and a half ago by a group of colleagues who kind of recognized that while there were many, many worthy projects and initiatives happening all across the country at the intersection of climate and culture, they were largely happening in isolation from each other. Um, you know, different disciplines not really speaking to each other, different parts of the country not really speaking to each other. And we thought in order for all of these projects, these worthy projects to have the kind of collective impact that they should when we think about like the transition to a climate safe future, we need to create a, a space for them to come together and collaborate. So that's really the driving idea behind scale. We're trying to create, we're trying to become a network of networks. We're still a very young organization. We're like less than a year since we incorporated as a nonprofit. Um, and everything has been done essentially by, um, you know, volunteers more or less. Um, I'm, I'm supported through the National Arts Centre to do this work, which is, I'm very, very privileged to do that. Uh, we're about to announce our first full-time staff person, thanks to funding from the Canada Council, so thank you, <laughs> which is really exciting. And I would invite all of you, if you haven't already signed up, please join us. Um, 
Donna earlier today meant a reference to a book that you read three. I'm also very, very inspired by Christiana Figueres and her team. And one of the ideas that she that I've heard her talk about many times um, that's really been particularly inspiring for me is this idea that in order to um, mobilize the kind of transformation that we need, the kind of systemic change that we need, we need to get we need to foster really inclusive, high-level collaboration. So it's, it's as, as, as no matter how good the work that you're doing is, it's not, like in order to really propel us into that cultural transformation that we need, we need to be working together across sectors, uh, sorry, ac I mean across within the sector, but also reaching out to other sectors, between disciplines, between different regions of the country, between different cultural communities. So that's really the idea behind scale. We're trying to be a network of networks. Um, you know, to your point, Carolyn, about working with other, um, even beyond the sector, where we are, that's one of, there are already some projects some of you may be aware of. For example, Judith Marcuse and her Futures Forward project is one example that I'm aware of, where, um, you know, it's, whether it's the embedded artist model or um, mentorship models, there's different ways that artists can work with, for example, environmental NGOs. So SCALE is looking ahead to some of projects like that that we'd like to be doing, particularly with environmental NGOs and others in society telling the climate story um, in this kind of network to network approach. And we just, I really want to warmly invite all of you to come and be part of that. Certainly Music Declares is already part of that. It's when people doing this, artists and culture makers from all over the country, again, like working in different disciplines and in different roles, find out about each other and each other's work, it's just so, the, the, the potential for impact is suddenly exponential. Um, the one other thing I'll just talk about before I pass the mic back is our three modes of engagement framework. And this is a conceptual framework first articulated by David Maggs, who's a Metcalf Innovation Fellow. And it's something we've adopted um, at scale that really kind of permeates our work. So the three modes, mode one we call greening the sector. And that's that operational piece. So how do we, re and it's like very much the, the, the creative green tools and various other projects. Um, ACT, I think, is doing it, Eco Seno in Quebec, and many other wonderful folks doing this work um, of all these tools and uh, resources and initiatives to reduce the impact of our own activities, whether that's you know touring or production, whatever it is. Um, super important, of course, we all need to be doing that. Um, but it's also no different than what every other sector has to do. So where it, like, then the next step is, okay, what is it that only the arts can do? And we've been talking about that today a lot as well, right? So. And we talk, mode two for us, we call it raising the profile. So it's that piece about raising awareness, hopefully raising responsiveness, raising concern, um, making sure everybody's thinking about this issue. Um, activism is very, is, is a mode two kind of approach. And sometimes, you know, you hear artivism, like art combined with activism. Um, but like as Soren was talking about uh, at, when we began the day, there's, there's also something that even goes beyond that raising the profile piece. We call it mode three, reauthoring the world. And that, you know, the one way that I like to describe it is that mode two is like the push away from our current destructive ways of living and being. And mode three is the pull towards the horizon of possibility of how we could be living in the future. And it is up to us, it is up to all of us in this room and everyone we work with to, to create that pull so that people know what they are working towards, not just what they are running from. And so that's, uh, we call it the three modes of engagement. That's a framework we work with a lot. And um, anyway, I just, again, would warmly invite all of you to come and join us at scale so that we can be more effective as a network of networks and connect you to people working in other disciplines and in other parts of the country and also eventually internationally who are doing similar work. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you and it's, you know, 
sometimes we think nothing is happening and then you start to have the conversations and you start to realize there's a lot happening and it's just a matter of connecting the dots and that was really I think a large part of the vision behind doing this summit is we found, well, when it came to scale and even when it came to creative green tools, there were not a lot of representatives from the music sector compared to theater, visual arts, film, um, TV, and there's only a few folks involved in scale, and I think even for the creative climate leadership program that Canada Council helped to fund, where there was, was it 24 or 30? Um, 24 people who did um, a program that developed by Julie's Bicycle in the UK um, and done with the Center for Sustainable Practice um, in the Arts, bringing together um, people who either are artists or work in arts administration to become climate leaders. And there was only four folks who did that program who identified or were connected to the music sector. So I think within music, we can both be inspired by some of the work that's happening in other artistic disciplines and then see this as a space to kind of pull together and deepen involvement in scale and creative green tools. So, so thank you all for highlighting the work that you're doing. Um, and I guess a question that, that I have is, do you, do you see a push coming not a push, but maybe an invitation from levels of government um, or possibly more funding that could come that would be directed towards both the kind of creative, that kind of third level that you're talking about, Judy, of like reimagining the new world, like changing everything, because we do need to reauthor and reimagine what our post-carbon world is going to look like to use that term or any other term, but like we have to dramatically change how we work, how we play, how we create art, make art. And sometimes I think people have a, a negative view of what that world looks like. And I think the, the task of, of artists is to make that a really enticing, juicy future, because it is, right? When you think about what we need to do, it's actually a beautiful future. And so I think making that future more just more tangible and more desirable is part of what we're doing. Um, is there more funding to come? Do you see that? Or what are some of the barriers in terms of getting more uh, support to be able to fund all three levels of engagement on climate? Well, I'll start by being a wet blanket. Um, our government uh, is is not in an expanding spending mode. And I think, um, you know, for those of us who live in Ottawa and have to deal with the political rumblings around us every day, uh, you know, we are um, at a volatile stage uh, in our political landscape and we have potentially a conservative government somewhere down the line and they are not likely to be um, particularly generous in that regard. That being said, um, there's a lot we can do with what we've got. And uh, when you're talking about um, barriers and one of the questions you'd send in advance, I, I think I, I can certainly speak for Canada Council. We can fund more projects than we're funding now. I mean, that's one of the reasons I came here today is to say apply. Uh, we can. And, um, and you can be creative about them because some of the funds that are available, particularly through the Strategic Innovation Fund, are pretty open-ended in what you can do. Um, and uh, for all artistic projects, to, to your point, of course our ongoing programs are doing this as well. But uh, there are opportunities. And when you think about the impact of amplifying and leveraging funding, across funders, with, with uh, private foundations, which is something we're starting to work on. I'm also interested in engaging um, private investors in this space. We have to remember we need to continue to make the case for how important the arts are in these larger conversations. I, I think everyone in this room is already convinced, but um, there's still some work to be done in terms of making that case to those who open their purse strings. And one of the ways we can make that case is to be more relevant to more people um, and across sectors so that people say, hey, those artists are really important. They really matter. Why aren't they in your next budget? 
Um, and I, you know, Sarah Harmer was very actually, I, I was just very brave to say, go engage with your local politicians and get them on the case. I mean, that's really being an activist artist. Um, but even if you don't go that far, there are lots of ways to exercise uh, influence and to be part of this bigger conversation. I can't, I, I really can't emphasize enough what you just said about the connecting of people who are already doing interesting work, because it's so true. When we started this fund and started looking into it, we had no idea how many pockets of interesting, locally-based work were happening around the country, completely unaware of one another. And once you start to source them and connect them in ways such as scale, um, that, that the, the amplification is exponential. And I think everybody here today has said that. This collective action piece is absolutely the way to go. So do not despair about the funding piece. It's the long, but I started with the wet blanket, but I'm trying to be long. <laughs> Ditto to everything that was just said. Um, yeah, I'm glad you were the wet blanket first. Yeah, I, we are definitely bound by within our own budgetary restrictions, just like all of you. Um, but we welcome creative ways to use that, and we welcome input. And so we ask ourselves the question regularly, do we realizing that it might cost more to do this, does that then means we're not funding something else or we're funding fewer projects, um, and maybe that's the right direction. But we also look to you either in terms of just talking to us, uh, but also in terms of what the assessors are looking at in front of them and, and how they, they, their artists speaking that, that uh, the, the same language and, and making some of those priorities and those decisions for us in how they're looking at the applications. And I, again, I will reiterate, just because it doesn't say environmental considerations on, uh, on um, in a criteria, doesn't mean that they're not absolutely thinking about that in terms of what the creative project is that's being put forward and how it's being done. And, you know, it's not new that we've funded Side. It's not new that we've funded um, presenters who are doing pedal-powered uh, productions. It's not new that, um, and you know, there, there's always uh, there's always a desire for for the assessors to look at. Oh, you, you, you may not think to talk about those sort of side things in part of your application, but those assessors are paying attention always. Um, to those choices that that you're making and it, it and when they have those options I know someone earlier was talking about options the the choice of, of making the the environmentally friendly decision and you know if they're given that option they'll they'll walk through that door um, so I don't know that I had a <laughs> direct answer to your question uh, but and partnerships we're definitely interested in ourselves also assisting to build those partnerships and connections with other sectors. We've done that in different ways over the years, but um, they'll, they'll de there's definitely a refocus on, on that in a whole uh, wide arena of areas, so this will be part of it for sure. So I'm in a super privileged position because I get to like meet all kinds of people who are doing, who are passionate about this work and nothing makes me happier than connecting them to each other. Um, and I just have this, you know, my aspiration for scale for the future is that, you know, as I'm hearing about this, in, like, you know, like the Hillside Festival, for example, which before today, I didn't know that much about it. Um, and so now I'm like really excited to go and say, okay, I want like to show, share this example, particularly with um, organizations in other disciplines who like for whom this is going to be like, I want the fringe festivals to get on board with this and you know like my mind is kind of exploding with ideas and then um, you know some research projects that I'm aware of that are happening like one in particular that I'm uh, connected to um, called Irresistible Worlds isn't that a great title um, and it's a research project specifically around that three modes of engagement framework and really looking at how we understand mode three what it looks like um, what kind of impact it can have and how we know it's having impact. So th those are all some like really big questions that we're grappling with right now. Um, and I wanna be able to share that research as 
you know, and then there are many, 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 those are just two examples, you know, but there are many examples that, you know, we, if we, sh the better we're able to share all this information um, and share with each other, the less duplication there's going to be and the more impact, you know, as you were saying, Carolyn, the more impactful we can be. When it comes to funding and advocacy, um, we, I think we, you know, speaking for scale, we have a long way to go bef before we uh, become the network we aspire to be, but on our journey to becoming that network, the, the more expansive and, and diverse and uh, dynamic a network we can build, the more effective we will be in advocating for funding. So please come join us. I've got cards, you can all just... <laughs> can I jump in and say one more thing that I was thinking about? I think the other role that funders often play that gets forgotten by the community is doing research. Um, so we're not going to say, hey, look at our research. We're not a, an organization who, that it, we're attached to government. We're arm length arm agency of the government of Ontario. We're not advocates. That's not our role. But we can share research about the field, the importance of the arts, um, and I have done a lot of work in, in various areas there that you can use in the work you do as advocates. So it might not look for it on our website. Look for that research section. That is, you, the, there's, there's stuff there that, that you can use in, in some of the work you, are, you do, um, but we're not going to be using it that way. It is a tool we're offering for you, so, so look for it. And if you're not seeing um, the type of research that you want or the type of information you want, ask us about it, because we're continuing to um, look at questions we ask uh, arts organizations or the broader community about uh, the role of the arts. And definitely there is a role when it comes to the environment, so yeah. <laughs> I just want to jump in to say we actually do consider ourselves advocates at Canada Council for the Arts. That's something we are um, pretty actively pursuing, in fact. And uh, we are an arm's length crown corporation, but our arm's length does give us the ability to move within government decision-making circles and to make a point of supporting um, areas where we think there are gaps that the government needs to look at. Uh, and I can say one of those areas, for example, is um, the remuneration of artists. I mean, the fact that, I mean, we know that the pandemic wasn't the reason that artists are badly paid. They were badly paid before the pandemic, and then the pandemic made it all much, much worse, uh, which is true of many of the, the, the really serious fault lines in the art sector. They were all there just waiting for that pandemic to make the, the, the structure, which was very fragile, really collapse. Uh, and the music was hard. It, the entire performing arts sector has been pretty much decimated by this last two and a half years. So um, there's a lot of work to be done to rebuild. And rebuilding the, you know, with the, with the vision of a better future. Um, and I was very glad that there was a panel on diversity and intersectionality, by the way, because that new world we want to imagine for ourselves has to have that lens. We know that climate justice in particular, since this is a climate summit, does not affect people, as was so perfectly said by you earlier, does not affect all people equally. And there are a number of, of marginalized communities who've been much harder hit by climate change than, than privileged ones. So there, there's lots of aspects of climate change we wanna, we wanna be able to look at. Um, but advocating for the importance of artists uh, and the arts for culture, but even more broadly for society, dare I even say it, for democracy, um, it's kind of, it's like it has to be done. Somebody's got to do it, and we're certainly doing it. You guys are more compelling than we are, uh, that's for sure, but uh, we're there. And um, one of the things we need to do is actually have you do more of that on our website. So it's not our boring faces, it's your fabulous ones. Thank you, that's all so exciting and so good to hear that there is funding available, that there is a commitment to, to seeing more projects, more connections, more collaboration, um, more diverse representations of a future that, that people want and um, 
and heartened to hear that the Canada Council does do that advocacy because I do think there's such a strong connection between culture, between art and democracy. And I don't think it's a coincidence. You know, I remember talking to someone who is from Brazil about the dictatorship there and many of the, the sort of dictatorships in the 70s and 80s in South America, and some of the first people that were arrested were the political musicians and political artists because they knew that they were so powerful, they needed to take their mic away, they knew they had the ability to, to inspire that collective action. And so I think, yeah, it's not overstating the critical relationship that culture and arts have with democracy. And I, it does feel like we're in such a vulnerable moment right now, both in Canada and around the world in terms of the fragility of democracy and the implications of that in terms of reimagining the world with, with climate at the center. So these are all really important conversations and it makes me feel inspired that um, Music Declares Emergency, you know, it can maybe access some of this funding too because I know that, you know, we and other organizations that are springing up wanting to play a role um, with with culture or music and climate are trying to sort out how to fund ourselves. So I want to, again, like thank all of the funders for today. We really pulled it together with a bit of a wing and a prayer without a whole lot of resources <laughs> just because we knew that we needed to um, show an idea, have a proof of concept to be able to expand this next year. And we are speaking with folks in Quebec about doing a truly national summit next year that will be bilingual um, and well-funded. <laughs> so um, so it's good to hear that there are some, some of that funding is available. And um, you might not have the answer to this, but examples or ideas you mentioned family foundations, and I think that's a really important place for us to look, but what are some other places that we might explore funding? You know, a friend of mine, when I was telling her about the idea we have with Music Declares Emergency Canada of, could we not get funding, we have a proposal, but could we not get funding from the government in some sectors of the music industry to try and get a fleet of electric tour buses and tour vans, right, wrapped with no music on a dead planet, and musicians who want to tour across Canada on them get to do so for free or low cost by, by advertising the fact that they're on a zero emissions vehicle, and most importantly, as I know Devin has mentioned and other people have mentioned, doing advocacy on the piece of audience travel, right? Encouraging their audience saying, hey, look, we're on an electric tour bus, this is why, and since we are, here's, here's an incentive to come to our concert on public transit or on bicycles. And this is where we need to have government officials, and we did invite people from the city, and we invited um, various federal ministries to be here because they're the ones who have influence on our public transit system, who create better bicycle parking. So it's that policy piece is also so very important. But anyway, she's like, you should go to Dragon's Den. Just get a group of people and try to get some investors. I don't really want to go on Dragon's Den, but <laughs> um, any ideas of what might be, I mean, some of you are in Ottawa, might be out there that we could start to access to try and help venues, to try and help labels, what are some other sources of funding that you might imagine might be available to us? Anyone? Well, just off the top of my head, I would say if, you're, if you want electric um, buses to be funded, you should go to the company that's manufacturing them. Yeah. If you get some sponsorship from them, and you can go to the Heritage Canada mm -hmm. and, or the Environment uh, Minister and or Transport and or interdepartmental yeah. with a manufacturer, put a package together and they all look good, you might be successful. Yeah. But you guys out there would have other ideas about greening, what we want to hear. So um, in the, uh, one of the IPCC reports, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports that came out last year, um, they, the IPCC scientists estimated with a high degree of confidence that 40 to 70 percent of the emissions reductions that need to happen globally between now and 2050 will come from what they call socio-cultural factors or demand-side mitigation. That's IPCC speak, 
for us, for the cultural sector. And they have no idea how that works. It's just like this vague notion that somehow these emissions are gonna come from what they call socio-cultural factors. And, you know, I think that's the kind of, um, I mean, no, don't wanna use that word, sorry. Um, <laughs> but like armed with that kind of um, quote, I think there's a possibility now that, 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 we, that we can look to foundations and funders in the environmental realm and try to help them understand the importance of the role of the arts in meeting climate and environment imperatives. So, and that's also like, you know, full disclosure, I haven't actually tried that yet, but it's definitely something that we're planning to do. Um, and um, I forgot the second half of my point, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think what you said was all the same lines of what I was thinking and and um, I like we're, we're privileged in our, in our sector to be creative thinkers <laughs> um, so and to be audacious to be bold um, to go up to somebody that you have never met before that you have no contact with and say something um, and ask what's possible, and I think that's something in our tool bag as, as artists and arts organizations that we should pull out and use and direct in those areas where, um, where we haven't tried before, perhaps. Um, and that's certainly what we're thinking about right now as an organization, so I would encourage you to do the same. Yeah, you remembered. Excellent. <laughs> so one of the other things that SCALE hopes to do in the future and that we're kind of encouraging others to consider in the cultural sector is to move into, into spaces where there traditionally hasn't been any representation from the arts and culture sector in the discussions, particularly at the policy level, around climate and environment imperatives. So what, the, what this could mean, for example, you know, Canada has a net zero advisory board. Why is there zero cultural representation on that advisory board or various other um, opportunities where there's some kind of uh, round table or advisory board or something um, at, at whatever level of government, there should always be some kind of cultural representation in those spaces, recognizing the enormous role that arts and culture has to play in terms of meeting those climate and environmental imperatives. And that's certainly something that SCALE is promoting and hopes to get involved with in the future as we kind of ramp up our capacity. Stick your nose in, just like I did today, and I'm now on the stage. <laughs> Ask the question. Awesome. Before we wrap up, and I will say, when we finish here, you're welcome to come downstairs. There's a downstairs room, just to have some conversations, you know, follow up with people, sort of dream about things that could come out of today, and and uh, imagine what that future could be. Um, but are there any questions for our wonderful panelists? No? Okay. If not, I'm just going to make a few, just a few plugs. Um, one is I hope some of you will be returning this evening for the concert. It's an amazing lineup. I'm so excited. I couldn't have dreamed of a better more exciting lineup of musicians. Um, I think it's gonna be a, quite a beautiful event. Um, I also wanna invite you, if you are interested, we have our No Music on a Dead Planet t-shirts, and we ordered these from a company called Iconic, who we worked with Fashion Takes Action last year to do a bunch of sourcing to make sure that we were going to manufacture the most sustainable t-shirts possible. In Canada so we do have them out there and Isaac Meyer Odell is a photographer so if you want to have your photo taken with a banner or a t-shirt encourage you to do that um, do you have a question Leah yeah
Ooh, ser- I mean, I've, I've only, I haven't delved into it. I know that the serious thing just got announced in the last couple of days. Is that right? Right. I guess I've just been seeing people writing about it. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a conversation, a strategy conversation for downstairs, because I do know it has very, very huge implications on Canadian artists and revenue, and that Sirius is, you know, a big source of the SOCAN money that you get on a quarterly basis. Unless, does anyone have? Yeah. Just because I don't want to not answer. We have, I mean, all those, anytime there's news, or information about how little of how how those diminishing revenues are are impacting artists. I mean, it it hurts us, and it hurts us hearing about it. Um, and we always want to make sure in our programs that artists are paid fairly, and the assessors want to make sure artists are paid fairly, um, and. Again, that is just generally about the advocacy that, uh, that my colleague was talking about from the Canada Council. Um, and I think that is part of our role, is to remind people that um, people, and I don't mean just government or other industries, but to remind the public of the importance of paying artists for their time and their work and for what they bring to the community. Um, and that is, again, about your connection with your local MPP. That is about making those community connections and asking for pay when you're doing something um, and normalizing that. Um, so it's not a direct answer to that, but it's definitely something that's on our minds constantly. Thank you. I have a few ideas, too, about that are, that are bubbling up, so we'll, we'll chat. Um, all right, there's no other questions. I want to thank everybody so much for your participation, your great questions, your deep listening, the wonderful side conversations, your present presence and your support of Music Declares Emergency Canada. We too are a brand new organization. We incorporated as a nonprofit in April of this year. We have a very, very hardworking all volunteer board of directors. Um, we want to continue to be involved in scale and with Creative Green Tools Canada and want to continue to grow our presence here in the Canadian music landscape and continue to have um, an impact. So please do reach out to us about how to, to be involved. And I'm, I'm very heartened that there are so many organizations who are working together and collaborating on this. And I uh, would love to have some informal conversations downstairs and hope to see many of you tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>